welcome everybody to uh, this uh, um, GGI uh, Tidre Colloquium. Today, our speaker, uh, uh, we are delighted to have uh, uh, Rafael Flauger from uh, UC San Diego. Uh, Rafael uh, is a well known, uh, still young cosmologist, um, and uh, um, he received his PhD under uh, uh, the late uh, Steven Weinberg. And then uh, uh, he held uh, postdoctoral positions at uh, Yale, uh, NYU, and uh, IAS. Uh, and uh, he uh, has uh, a interesting uh, and very diverse uh, uh, research uh, portfolio. He studies uh, um, um, string theory uh, models uh, uh, for cosmology, and uh, also he's uh, an expert uh, of data analysis, uh, especially uh, with regard to the cosmic microwave background. Uh, so today, in fact, uh, he will uh, uh, put together uh, uh, his uh, two interests to tell us uh, from a data perspective, uh, what uh, we can uh, hope uh, to learn from CMB about the fundamental theory. Okay, the stage is yours. Thanks, uh, thanks, Guido. Uh, first, let me thank the organizers for organizing this uh, really nice seminar series and for trying to keep everyone sane during this uh, interesting period. And uh, also, thanks for the for the invitation. And of course, for the patience it took, even that I temporarily lost my employment authorization. So I really appreciate the, uh, the patience. And uh, yeah, so the, the title I got from Guido was New Physics from the CMB the next decade. And I'll, I'll mostly stick with it. I'll make uh, one small change and just add and a half after that, because it'll take a little bit more patience until we actually have results from some of the experiments that I think we're all looking forward to. And uh, then I think given the, the second part, uh, it's, it's clear that I won't really be talking about any new physics results today. This is just an outlook of what we, what we have to look forward to for the, from the next set of uh, CMB experiments. And I think for this uh, seminar and for this audience, I don't really have to remind people how far the CMB community has come uh, since the original uh, serendipitous discovery of the CMB by Penzias and Wilson and the interpretation of that measurement of excess antenna temperature as cosmic black body radiation by the, by the Princeton group. And I'll just uh, skip the history, although I'm happy to discuss any, anything that people are interested in, and I'll just show you the current set of uh, state of affairs where you see that we now have very nice uh, temperature maps. So at the time, the monopole was detected at around, I mean, uh, three Kelvin at the time. Now we have these uh, amazing maps where the scale uh, is, is set in, in micro Kelvin. And uh, even though this looks maybe like noise, this is really what the sky looks like. So there's no, uh, this wouldn't change if you took it with a, with a perfect instrument. This is essentially it as far as the temperature data is concerned. And you can see here the, the beautiful uh, angular power spectra that uh, Planck has measured. Red is the data, blue is the, the theory curve. And you see that there's excellent agreement and the same is true for the polarization. Now, uh, I'll be showing these plots uh, over and over. And I, I think most of you are very familiar with them, uh, so, but I just wanted to make sure that since this is a, a more general talk that I don't lose anyone. So I'll, I'll just briefly introduce the, the different quantities and then uh, we'll, we'll move on. So uh, just for those of you who already know all this, um, I apologize and it'll, it'll be quick. So I just want to make sure everyone can, can follow what I'm saying. So the, the data uh, is usually presented in the form of temperature maps as well as maps of Stokes Q and U. Uh, in general, to fully characterize the radiation field, it also takes a Stokes V parameter. That's usually not reported because we expect the cosmic microwave background to be linearly polarized. So it's completely described by uh, temperature Q and U. Some experiments have reported um, upper limits on, on Stokes V, but it's usually not reported. So usually have uh, three maps, the temperature, Q and U. And of course, as theorists, we can't really hope to predict the, the particular realization of the map we're looking at. We can only predict the statistical properties. And so really what we're predicting are things like correlation functions. Here I'm just writing two point functions in general to, to characterize it. You would also need the higher endpoint functions. 
for the data analysis, it turns out to be more convenient. This is really, I don't, it's not that interesting if someone wants to know exactly why that is, we can discuss, but it's more convenient to, to essentially Fourier transform the, the fields and uh, expand the, the temperature field in terms of spherical harmonics, work with the expansion coefficients, and similarly to combine Stokes Q and U in this way, uh, make it a, a section of a line bundle and expand it in terms of the spin two weighted spherical harmonics, then you get expansion coefficients APLM, which then have the same transformation properties under rotation as the ATLMs. Uh, this, because it's a, a complex line bundle, still doesn't have quite the same properties as this one or has more degrees of freedom. So this is usually decomposed into what are known the, as the E modes and the, the B modes, something like morally a, a real and imaginary part, obviously not quite, but uh, uh, morally you can think about it that way if you want. Then under parity, the transformation properties for these two things differ. One uh, transforms morally like a vector field, even though these, these are spin two quantities. So it's not uh, literally that, but it transforms like minus one to the a, uh, L times a uh, LM. Uh, whereas for the B modes, there's an additional minus sign. And so that's what uh, distinguishes them. And that's a, a key uh, difference because, uh, yeah, as we'll see later. So the correlations then, instead of uh, reporting the correlation functions, you usually report the angular power spectra, which are defined in this way as the ensemble averages of these multiple coefficients. And so it's clear that you can take correlations between TT, so you get the temperature auto spectrum. That's what I was uh, showing on the on the left. Then you can look at cross correlations between the, the temperature and the E modes. You can look at the E mode auto spectrum, the B mode auto spectrum. In general, <clears throat> you could imagine also measuring the temperature B mode cross spectrum uh, or the, the EB cross spectrum. The reason those are usually not shown is because in a theory that respects parity, you expect them to be to be zero. If your fluctuations are uh, Gaussian, then uh, as you know, all you have to know are the, the properties of the, the two-point functions, the odd endpoint functions then vanish. The higher order even endpoint functions are, are sums of products of the two-point functions. And so all we need are really the angular power spectra that I showed you before. Um, these we can predict from any, any underlying theory and we can uh, measure them from the map. In practice, you just take the map you uh, decompose it and then you square them and average them. Uh, this is simplified because in practice, the, the sky uh, has cuts where you cut out the galaxy. So there's some complications in what exactly these formulas look like, but morally that's, that's what's going on. And then one can compare the two. On, on average, this reproduces the, the theory expectation uh, there's some uh, some scatter, which is called cosmic variance. And so that's the, the basic setup. Then uh, just one slide uh, to give you an idea how fast the field has evolved. In 1997, this is what the, the status of the measurements of the angular power spectrum looked like. Uh, by now, this is what it looks like. So here we have the, the temperature um, auto spectrum, the E mode auto spectrum, and then the TE cross correlations. One thing that I didn't define are these uh, D sub L's. These are essentially the C sub L's, except for a factor of L times L plus one over two pi. So this is what's, uh, what's shown here. So that's something that's traditionally shown. Uh, since the Planck measurement so around the time, and since then, several experiments have still been taking data. So some of these experiments, I'm, I'm sure you, you know, there's SPT poll, SPT 3G, there's bicep keck, there's the, the spider balloon, there's uh, polar bear, uh, act pole, advanced act, uh, class. And this is not really a complete list. So there's, uh, there's additional experiments that I'm, I'm not showing here just because this light gets too busy. Um, and uh, you might wonder what these experiments are really looking for, given that we have these, uh, these beautiful measurements. And to understand that better, I wanted to just uh, show you uh, one plot that shows all the, the spectra uh, on the same uh, on the same plot. So here you see the the temperature auto spectrum. Uh, black is again the the theory prediction. Uh, the gray small light gray line here that's the the CMB. Eventually, as you get to small scales, there are unresolved foregrounds that make it deviate from that. Uh, blue is the the Planck data. 
And then you say, see that we're almost, or Bank has almost measured the temperature data up to the point where the returns are really diminishing because you're hitting the, the unresolved foregrounds. Then you see the, the emotes, you see that they're, they're fainter. You see the part that Planck has measured very nicely. There is also measurements. Uh, there are also measurements from Planck on, on larger angular scales that I'm not showing here. Uh, uh, the reason is just that the large angular scale was very difficult to measure in Planck. And I think that's something uh, that will have to be remeasured uh, to, to have higher uh, confidence in exactly what is going on, exactly what the optical depth is. I'll, I'll mention that in a, in a second. And then you also see that if you go to small scales, uh, the E-mode power spectrum really hasn't yet been uh, 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 measured with, with Planck. There are some uh, measurements from, from the ground, but we'll talk about that uh, more. So that's exactly what one is trying to fill in. And in this plot, this maybe looks like a, a negligible part where you think, okay, you covered most of it, but that's the, the wrong way to think about it. And maybe it doesn't help that I made it a, a log log plot. Uh, the point is that as you go to higher L, the number of, uh, of modes per L increases like 2L plus 1. That's the usual 2L plus 1 that you know from, uh, from quantum mechanics or electromagnetism. And so uh, there's, in fact, if you take everything together and uh, keep in mind that you can compute the TE cross spectra, there's more information in the CMB left to be extracted than has been extracted so far. And that's what the experiments are, are still trying to do. In addition, there are lensing B modes. So the, the CMB on its way to us passes through the, the large scale structure and is lensed. That lensing uh, converts some of the E modes into B modes. That's something else we can, uh, we can detect. And uh, that's something else that's being done. And of course, then there's the, the hope uh, that we may be able to use the, either the degree scale or large scale uh, polarization to detect or, or at least constrain primordial gravitational waves. So there's the possibility to see an imprint of primordial gravitational waves on the cosmic microwave background. And these are the kind of areas where the, the CMB is going. So the, uh, the goal is to measure the large scale polarization to learn about uh, both the optical depth. I'll say a little bit more why that's important uh, to measure primordial gravitational waves and to measure the small scale uh, polarization and isotropies and all together, uh, there's still a lot of uh, information about both astro and particle physics that can be extracted from the cosmic microwave background. And that, that's what I'll uh, try to say more about uh, in, in today's talk. And I should say, if there's questions, you should just interrupt me at any point. Um, so first, let me say a little bit about the, the different parts that I mentioned already. So first, the, the large scale polarization, this, as I said, contains information about the, the optical depth to the surface of last scattering. Uh, in terms of physics, what that tells you about, it tells you when uh, the universe um, became reionized and how it became reionized. Now, you might say that if you're really interested in, in that, then you might as well go out and look at that epoch and, and see what the universe did during that time. And I think uh, with that, I, I, I might agree, but there's an additional uh, reason why one wants to measure the optical depth and you cannot really measure the relevant optical depth uh, from low redshift measurements because there might be some period of where the, the universe was partially uh, ionized between the redshifts one can access and the last scattering surface. So you really want to measure the optical depth to the surface of last scattering with the CMB because it also uh, enters measurements of things like the, the sum of neutrino masses or really anything uh, that uh, requires you to know exactly how much power there is on, on different scales. Um, in addition, the large scale uh, polarization contains information about primordial gravitational waves through what is called the, the reionization uh, bump. And uh, so far, uh, this part of the data has really only been accessed from, from space. It's difficult to do that from the ground. That doesn't mean it's impossible. In fact, one of the experiments that I was showing you earlier, the class experiment is trying this and they had a nice uh, calibration paper earlier this year over the summer this year of uh, four years of data and the science papers uh, are, are in, in progress. So I guess we'll see uh, what can be done from the ground. I, I think if one can access this part from the ground, 
it may impact to some extent what I'm what I'm going to tell you, and may change a little bit what uh, what can be done from the from the ground uh, overall. Um, then the degree scale polarization is really a, the sensitive sensitive probe of gravitational waves. This is uh, trying to access this uh, what is usually called recombination uh, peak, and um, I think everyone here knows that these uh, gravitational waves are pristine relic from the primordial universe. It's really difficult to modify them by any, any dynamics uh, after, they're, uh, after they're created. And in the foreseeable future, their imprint on the polarization of the CMB is really our only way to detect them. Um, they're also, I think it's, it's obvious, they're statistically independent from the density perturbations. I mean, they correspond to the uh, perturbations in the in the metric, not in some scalar field or density, it's just statistically independent. And um, here I'm showing you uh, what the telescopes uh, look like that uh, will be used to, to look for them. So just to give you a, a sense of, of size, these are about a meter 50 and then half a meter uh, across here. And this you should contrast with the uh, telescopes that are used to measure the small scale polarization, which have a, a six meter mirror. So these are much bigger. And uh, these, the data from these instruments will be used to constrain the number of relativistic species, the sum of the neutrino masses, properties of dark matter, interactions of dark matter with baryons, uh, the properties of uh, dark energy. You can uh, more tightly constrain the statistical properties of the primordial density perturbations, get tighter constraints on an S running and so on. And this is also the data that will be uh, useful for the discussion of the, the Hubble tension in particular, because it constrains proposed solutions to the tension. And I'll say a little bit more about it, uh, and then we can see if, if people want to discuss it more. Now, I want to briefly explain why there is this um, uh, bifurcation in, in telescopes. Um, and to do that, I'm showing you uh, a plot here. So here I'm showing you usually what I'm uh, what I was showing before was always the L times L plus one times CL here because the noise is more easily um, plotted in uh, in terms of CL. I'm just showing CL. That means the spectra look a bit different from what was before, but you have the same E mode angular power spectra that I was showing you before. The lensing B modes, and then here the the gray curve is the, the noise curve from the large aperture telescopes. And you see that that's very good at capturing, uh, because it's large, it has high resolution at capturing the small scale anisotropies, but it has relatively high noise on the degree angular scale. So it's not really the best way to go for primordial gravitational waves, whereas the, the smaller telescopes have much better noise characteristics on large angular scales, but then lose out on the small scales because the, the beam is much larger and you just can't resolve the, the small uh, anisotropies. And this is why you have a, a combination of these two. And I should say that even if you're not interested necessarily uh, in the, the physics on the small scales in the anisotropies, which I, I mean, I think you should be, but let's say even if you're only interested in gravitational waves uh, or B modes, then you still need a combination of these two telescopes because you have to remove the, the lensing B mode. So even the gravitational wave searches uh, will rely on the, the two sets of, of telescopes, the data from the two sets of telescopes, because you can then measure, map the E and B mode polarization um, to high accuracy on, on small scales and use that to remove the, the lensing B modes also on, on larger angular scales. And so uh, the two sites uh, that I'll discuss are uh, the, the two sites that are traditionally used, um, uh, the, the South Pole and Chile. So here I'm showing you what the, the sky coverage looks like for the different searches. If you're interested in gravitational waves, as, uh, certainly as long as you haven't detected any and you're just trying to set an upper limit, you're trying to go deep on a, on a small patch of sky uh, to make a, as good an image of, of that patch of sky as you can. And so for that, it's very good to use the South Pole because you can observe any uh, the, a given patch for a, as long as you want over and over. Whereas in Chile, the, any given patch will set. And so you can't always uh, observe the same patch of the sky. 
But if you're then interested in like relics, uh, this one seems to be perhaps a disadvantage for the gravitational waves uh, is it becomes an advantage for the light relics because you can really cover much of the sky from uh, from by uh, observing from from Chile, and so there's this two uh, two sets of sites and uh, observing patterns. So these are the kind of observing patterns that you'll see in the in the upcoming surveys. So there will be different surveys, one focusing on the gravitational waves, the other one on small scale anisotropies, which I'm here uh, calling light relics, but really has information about a lot more. The reason is uh, usually often just referred to, to this is because that's what, what the science drivers are for, for that determine the properties of the, the instrument. So then hopefully this gives you some idea why there's this hybrid of large and small telescopes. And you'll see that moving forward, all the experiments look that way. So here I'm showing you the South Pole Observatory, which is uh, SPT and Bicep Keck joining forces. So here you have the, the small aperture telescopes, the Bicep Keck telescopes, and then you have the large aperture telescope from uh, SPT. And here I'm showing you the, the forecast. It's maybe a bit of a, a busy plot, so you don't have to, we, have, we don't have to focus on it too much, but it tells you uh, what the map level sensitivities are at a given frequency as a function of time. So if you're interested in exactly what uh, the, the plan is for, uh, for this set of experiments, you can see it from this plot. And then the lower panel shows you what you might be more interested in is what the constraints are on the tensor to scalar ratio, which I didn't really define because I'm assuming everyone knows, but in case you don't know what the tensor to scalar ratio is, what's uh, usually denoted R, it's just what you would think. It's the ratio of the power and tensor modes or gravitational waves to the power and, and scalar modes. And then you see that the, uh, the constraints get better and better as a function of time, as you would expect. And uh, you see also that the predictions uh, agree well with the uh, with the forecast. So this BK15 was a forecast. Now we're at BK18. I'll show that in a second. And that falls around, as I'll, I'll show you on the next slide, uh, sigma R of 0 0.009, which is around here, and also in, in good agreement with the, the forecasts uh, that are shown here. This is what that looks like. So these are, I, I don't have time to really discuss BK18 in, in great detail, but I'm happy to answer questions if people have any. So the upshot is that the tensor to scalar ratio is now known to be less than 0 0.035 at 95% confidence level. Here are the, the spectra. And here is the, the famous NSR plot. So NS, uh, of course, tells you how the uh, density perturbations change as a function of scale and R as the, the tensor to scalar ratio. And then here, the, the blue contour is what you get if you combine Planck uh, by a BK18 and barren acoustic oscillation data, you get this, uh, this constraint on the tensor to scalar ratio. And just to connect it to the previous plot, this actually corresponds to sigma R of 0 0.009. So the experiments really have been making uh, tremendous progress. Just uh, recall, uh, what the, the upper limits were with, uh, with Planck. So this is already significantly, significantly better than that. The next set of experiments is the Simons Observatory. I mean, I think by the name it was clear, I didn't specifically say, but this is at the, the South Pole. Uh, Simons Observatory is using the, the well, Chilean site. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. This is Valerie Rubakov. Uh, yeah. Question. My question is, uh, you showed us the uh, curve that goes slowly goes down the uh, sensitivity to R, right? The yeah. uh, is it just the statistics or there's something else going on? No, this is just the, the statistics. So this is just here, you see the map level sensitivity for the different maps. And you see that the maps get deeper and deeper as the, the instruments take data. So here, for example, 95, right now, most of the, uh, most of the constraining power for BK15 came from the, from the 150 gigahertz maps. This is uh, what this is saying. Then you have some information about the dust from 220 gigahertz. And then as time goes on, the, the data gets more and more sensitive, eventually gets overtaken by 95 gigahertz. There's additional data from 270, 30, 40 gigahertz. So it's just more and more data and uh, the statistics 
and that's pushing this down. This does in uh, take into account that you're using these multi-frequency observations to remove foreground. So it takes that into account. And then here is the, the dashed curve tells you what happens if you also include SPT3G uh, to delens this data, as I was mentioning before. And the red dashed curve here that I didn't mention is the raw sensitivity. So if you were to ignore the uh, real world effects, then this is the sensitivity the, the instrument would have. But because you have to remove foregrounds, the lens, you, you end up with these, uh, with these uh, constraints. And you expect to get to about uh, two times 10 to the minus three by 2023, 2024. And then it takes some time to analyze the data. But that's what this plot is showing. Thank you. Okay, so this is the, as I said, the uh, Simons Observatory, or will be the Simons Observatory's uh, joining forces between uh, ACT and uh, Polar Bear. And here, the constraints will be comparable. Is there another? No. Okay. So the, these constraints will eventually be, be comparable. Here is what is shown is uh, for different type of, uh, of foregrounds and different analysis techniques, but it's uh, similar constraints of uh, around two times 10 to the minus three on a, on a similar time scale. So that's what you can expect uh, by the end of the, the decade, certainly. And um, after that, uh, basically the entire uh, ground-based uh, US CMB community will join forces uh, and become CMBS4 with one observing site in Chile, one at the South Pole. And as I said, uh, this is motivated by the fact that it's easier to look for gravitational waves, at least as long as you're placing upper limits from the South Pole. And uh, <clears throat> certainly it's only possible to really constrain light relics and some of the neutrino masses in a meaningful way from, uh, from Chile. So that's why there's this uh, combination of two sites. And um, for the longest time, I always had to say, we're waiting to hear back from the decadal report. Now the decadal report as of November 4th is finally out. And I'm happy to report that CMB is four is in it. And so it says, uh, looks very good now. Looks like this is all really, uh, really happening, which is exciting. So here I'm just highlighting it in, in yellow. So this looks like it's going forward. So I'll say a little bit more about S4 and then I mentioned some other uh, experiments uh, as well that I'm also involved in. So CMB S4, the goal, uh, first let's talk about the gravitational waves. So here the goal is to either get a robust detection of primordial gravitational waves or to place an upper limit that constraints are to be less than 10 to the minus three at 95% confidence level. And then I think for everyone following the field, and even if you've just seen the previous slides, the, the main challenges are really the weak gravitational lensing that one has to remove and the galactic foreground. So this is something that has to be dealt with in addition to, of course, just the, the usual challenge of making a measurement at that level of sensitivity, because here we're really talking about uh, nano Kelvin uh, measurements of the, of the radiation field. Uh, visually, uh, the, the challenge is this. So visually here, what I'm showing you is what the, the theory curve looks like for, for R equals zero. And then what the spectra looks li look like at the different frequencies that will be used with uh, CMBS4. And uh, the, the goal is to tell the difference between these two spectra essentially at five sigma. So that doesn't look easy because you're really buried in foregrounds and lensing. Fortunately, you can remove some of the lensing, you can remove about 90% of the, the lensing and that makes the, the goal easier, but it's still a, clearly a challenge. Uh, based on the simulations that we're doing, we think it can be done. So here I'm showing you just one of my simulations where you see the, the CMB plus foreground residuals together with uh, what you would expect. And you see that that uh, works quite well. And because it's a simulation, you also know what the risk, so this is not used to produce this, but because it's a simulation, you can also check what the foreground re residuals really are. And so here they are shown, and I, I don't want to discuss them in detail, but the, the main point is that they're significantly below what you're trying to uh, detect. So it looks like certainly for typical foreground models, this can be done. And I think the good news is that by the time CMBS4 is happening, we will have a lot more information about the foregrounds from the experiments that come before then. So hopefully, 
uh, this will all work. This is what the upper limits would look like uh, in that uh, scenario. So let's say that we're unlucky and there isn't a signal for us to be detected that's larger than a few times 10 to the minus three. Uh, then this is what the plot would look like here. Are the, uh, in this case, this is from the S4 uh, DSR report. So this is the BK15 uh, still. Uh, then these are the forecasts that you would expect if you combine South Pole Observatory and Simons Observatory. And this is what the S4 constraints would look like in, in this kind of scenario. Let me say a little bit about the uh, reason or the rationale for targeting 10 to the minus three. Uh, certainly lower is always better, but here the, the uh, idea is that there really is a good reason for targeting a tensor to scalar ratio of a few times 10 to the minus three. And I'll, I'll briefly Give you that rationale. So first uh, note that inflation, I mean, could just be an accident. So it could be that there's simply an inflection point in the potential somewhere where you have a potential that near some point in, in field space looks like this, where you have uh, some constant plus a small linear term, small quadratic term, and some cubic term. If you're near such a space, such a place with small coefficients C1 and C2, then you, you, you get inflation. And this, it could be that we live in a, a universe like this. Uh, in such a case, the inflation only really lasts long enough if uh, C1 is small enough, that, that's easy to, to believe. In that case, you can then predict what the tensor to scalar ratio is. That's less than 10 to the minus five. And NS could be anything. So in this kind of uh, scenario, you would expect that we don't see any gravitational waves and you wouldn't know what to expect for, for NS. Um, the reason this is maybe not so nice is that it relies on you sitting near such an uh, such an inflection point. This is also, if you look at it dynamically, this I, I won't talk about it, but this is something that we've been studying with uh, Eugene Lim, Katie Clow, and uh, uh, and collaborators. And uh, it, this is also unstable against inhomogeneity, so it's not obvious that it's easy to to get this. Uh, type of inflation even started. So it's in some, it's fine tuned. Um, but so the other option is that you take the observed value of the spectral index seriously. So here it could be anything and data would just tell you that you want uh, C2 to be negative. Um, but uh, instead you may want to take this seriously and you might say that really NS minus one uh, is small just because it's one over the only really large number that's in the problem, which is the number of, of defaults before the end of, of inflation with some order one number, which I'm calling P plus one, but really there's no, no reason to call it that other than that makes numbers later convenient, but this is just uh, some order one number divided by N. Then uh, this is a general statement, as long as epsilon is small, it satisfies a differential equation that looks like this. And you can solve that differential equation, which gives you this solution. It's a first order differential equation. So you have one integration constant. If there's only this uh, large number n in the problem, everything else is order one. You would expect this quantity to be order one. And oops. then if you're not near that special value, you see that one of the terms dominates. Either you're left with this part or with this one to dominate. If the first one dominates, you get an epsilon that's p over 2n. Uh, the tensor to scalar ratio is 16 epsilon. So this just gives you a tensor to scalar ratio that's uh, 8p over n. Uh, you can also use this. I'm not really going through the algebra, but you can uh, show that this corresponds to a potential that looks like this, which is a monomial, which is why these are usually called monomial models. The other option is that the second term dominates, in which case the slow roll parameter looks like this. And this corresponds to potentials that during inflation are well approximated by this. And then if you add, you can probably recognize what these shapes are. These are either uh, hilltop models, meaning there's some little hilltop near the origin in field space, and then the field rolls off, or it's a plateau type model where you're approaching a plateau as you go to the uh, to large field values, depending on uh, on the value of, of P. And then if you look what these predict for the monomial models, uh, this is what you would expect. The reason it's a band is just because I'm showing an uncertainty on how reheating works in, in these models. Uh, you see that I think at this point, it's fair to say the data strongly disfavor these models. 
And I'm saying that even though we were working on uh, monomial models in the context of string theory, but it just doesn't look anymore like the, that's what the, the data is telling us. Um, then that pushes us in the direction of the, the plateau and hilltop models in, in this discussion. And they come with a characteristic scale over which the potential departs from a constant. So here I'm showing the plateau model where you're approaching a, a constant as the field goes to, to large field values and then uh, the potential changes and drops to the, to the minimum as you vary as the field varies over some characteristic scale M. And the integration constant you can show is just related to that scale in this way. So it's that scale over the Planck scale or in, in Planck units squared. And again, if you expect this to be order one, you would expect M to be in Planck. And there's good reasons uh, to also from a theoretical perspective to expect that M might come out around the Planck scale in certainly in models where they have a common origin. If you look at the Starobinsky model, you can see that that's the case because really the only scale that appears here uh, in, the, in the potential at the end of the day is the Planck scale that uh, appears outside here. So they really have a common origin. You can see that in practice by uh, going to the um, variables uh, to the scalar field variables by vial rescaling and then going to the canonically normalized field, you see that you get a potential that looks like this. So up to order one numbers, you get a characteristic, uh, characteristic scale that's M Planck just because that comes about from M Planck uh, outside the action. This is the same, same applies for, for Higgs inflation and many others. And uh, the, uh, this class of models in the NSR plane looks like this. So these are Poincaré disks that uh, Renata and collaborators have worked on. Uh, this is the uh, Storobinsky model. This is Higgs inflation. So they come out in, in this range of the NSR plane. And this is exactly the range that's being targeted by the, by the future experiments. This is also of relevance to the broader swampland discussion that you had nice talks on in this, uh, in this seminar series. Uh, so that's the, the target. And this is also the target for, uh, so that's the target for S4, but also for, for Lightbird, which I won't say as much about, uh, but I wanted to just highlight it. So this is a, an experiment that was selected by JAXA in 2019. So this is also something that's going ahead. The launch is scheduled uh, here for 2028. Exactly what the US contribution will look like is still a little bit unclear, but that doesn't matter, I think, for the, uh, for the rest of the experiment. I think it, it, it'll happen one way or the other. Of course, we hope that we can participate. Right now, we're still uh, participating as if it's going ahead in the US. We, we don't know. We'll see uh, what comes of it. Um, and this is different from S4. As you can see, Just it's a, a single uh, experiment. doesn't have the large and the small telescope. This one essentially just has the, the small telescope. So this is really dedicated to a measurement of the optical depth and uh, primordial gravitational waves. Of course, you can also do galactic science with it. Uh, but this is the, the upshot. And I think it would be nice to have both of them because you can use some of the higher frequency maps that are difficult to, to measure from the ground uh, that you get from Lightbird to help clean the, the foregrounds in the, in the CMB data and the CMBS4 data. And you can use CMBS4 data to de-lens um, Lightbird. So the, the two together would be quite interesting. Uh, we'll see exactly what, uh, what the landscape looks like, but it looks like there will be these two experiments. We had a more futuristic version of a satellite uh, with a higher resolution satellite uh, called PICO. Um, and I think uh, so far that's, that's mostly an, an idea. I'm not sure that uh, this, will, uh, this will happen on what time scale. I, I think if there were a detection from the others, then it's clear that you want to follow up. If there isn't, I'm not sure exactly what, uh, what people will decide. So uh, let me now talk a little bit about the light relics and neutrino mass. So light relics, I think everyone knows the name kind of suggests that already are just stable particles or long lived, meaning they are around at the time of, um, of recombination that are relativistic and free streaming at the time of recombination. They don't have to necessarily be massless. They just have to be relativistic at the time of recombination. And then their energy density and anisotropic stress uh, affect the diffusion scale and the phase of acoustic oscillations. The, just to, to introduce the nomenclature that's always used, the radiation energy density is parameterized in, in this way. Um, 
the one is obviously for the photons. Then the seven eighth is because this was usually uh, referring to neutrinos. Four eleventh is just the the usual uh, dilution factor that you get uh, between the uh, uh, between the neutrinos and the uh, and the photons in uh, from electron positron annihilation, and four thirds just because it's the energy density, uh, not the temperature. So, uh, and then an effective is just some number that measures this. You could have called this whole thing a constant, but traditionally this is what uh, how the number of relativistic degrees of freedom are defined. And uh, if you have light relics beyond the standard model, then you get a contribution that's usually called delta n effective that uh, makes n effective different from 3.046 in the standard model. I, I'm just quoting 3.046 because that's a number that's commonly used. There's actually active work to uh, make sure and pin down the, the last digit, but usually people just refer to it as 3.046, even though I think it's worth figuring that out given the level of accuracy that the experiments will achieve. Uh, so let me briefly show what the effects are. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit misleading. Uh, if you were to just vary that, you would get a different effect, but really the data constrains very well the matter radiation equality. Uh, so you want to keep, um, keep that fixed. And then you see that the effect of ineffective is to change the, the damping. So here, the lighter color is lower and effective. And as you go to darker col colors, ineffective goes up. So this is for the temperature data, for the, for the emo data. This is something one can look for. Then you might say, well, other things can affect the damping uh, scale, which is of course true. If, for example, you can change the amount of helium uh, and compensate for, for that because that changes the number of free electrons that are around. And so you can compensate. If you do that, there's still a residual uh, effect that's caused by the free streaming or the anisotropic stress, which is a, a change or shift in the phase of the acoustic oscillations, that's a little bit harder to see, but again, you see that the lighter colors are higher and effective, darker colors are lower and effective. And uh, you see that there's some phase shift. And in fact, even though it looks small, this has actually been detected by, by Planck and will be used by the upcoming experiments to constrain uh, the number of relativistic degrees of freedom. And it can break the degeneracy with other effects that cause uh, a change in the, in the, in the damping scale. The current constraints are shown here. So the current constraint by Planck is 2.99 plus minus 0.17. The forecasts for Simons Observatory are that you can constrain departures from the standard model value uh, or co constrain them to be less than 0.1 at 95% confidence level. Whereas CMBS4 is targeting uh, constraints at the level of 0 0.06 at 95% confidence level. And even though that doesn't look very big, uh, this change doesn't look very big in terms of delta ineffective, it is actually significant in terms of the underlying microphysics. And I'll try to show that in uh, the most basic toy model that you can write down. I think these are the model independent constraints that you should keep in mind. And if you have a model of beyond the standard model physics that you want to uh, constrain, then these are the, the constraints that, that you should keep in mind. But it's often useful to to translate that into the microphysics. And usually it, it, people use the most uh, simple-minded model that you can use, which I'll call standard model plus X, where X is some degree of freedom that, it's, uh, that at early times was in thermal equilibrium with the standard model, and then uh, decouples or freezes out uh, at some temperature TF, then that contributes if it's a scalar degree of freedom. So if you have a, a real scalar, that contributes if it freezes out very early, it contrib if, it, if it was in thermal equilibrium and then freezes out very early, it uh, leads to a contribution of 0.027 that sets, uh, that sets a floor. And so that's a natural thing that you would want to, to target. That's something that uh, we can't achieve, but there are interesting other targets that, uh, that we can achieve. Uh, so the way to read this plot, which I, I think often it's easier if the, the axes are, are flipped, but this is just what I took from the uh, from CMBS4 from, from our uh, DSR report. So the way you would want to read it is that let's say you have an additional scalar degree of freedom and it decouples at some temperature, then the purple uh, uh, by uh, this line shows you what the contribution to ineffective is. 
And as soon as you get above the, the constraint from CMBS4, this is excluded. So it excludes anything that decouples around the time of the Q QCD phase transition or after that. So it really constrains uh, that parameter space. And so you see that by, uh, especially for uh, fermions and for, for vector fields, the improvement in the measurement uh, for, uh, that's possible with CMBS4 really significantly pushes up the, the freeze out temperature, even though the change in, in effective is relatively small, it improves the uh, limits on the freeze out temperature by orders of magnitude. So this is just a simple benchmark model. If you have a, a specific uh, BSM model in mind, these are really the model independent constraints, but it's still, I think, useful to have this, uh, this kind of model uh, in mind for for reference, where you just have standard model plus plus x. For neutrino mass, let me just say that the uh, free streaming particles, not just neutrinos, so really the CMB doesn't specifically measure neutrino mass. It doesn't know what's a neutrino or what's some other free streaming degree of freedom. Uh, but these free streaming particles affect structure formation and hence the, the weak gravitational lensing of the CMB. And uh, this is shown here. So here what is shown is the change in the lensing power spectrum. So this you can reconstruct from measurements of the CMB. Uh, you can reconstruct the lensing field that's, that's causing the lensing. You can make a map of that. You can take the angular power spectrum and you can see how that changes as you change here the sum of the neutrino masses. Here really, when it's written like this, one has in mind the, the usual uh, standard model uh, behavior of neutrinos where they're relativistic uh, early on. If you had something that's produced non-relativistically early on, it really wouldn't contribute here because it's the free streaming of the particles that's important. But keeping that in mind, uh, the sum of neutrino masses or free streaming particles uh, has an effect on CL5 phi. That's shown here. So you see what the predictions are for um, the different sum of, let me also call it neutrino masses, zero, 30 milli electron volts, six, 60 milli electron volts, which is of course the, the minimum value for the normal mass hierarchy of 58. Then you have uh, 90, 120, and you see here the, the measurements, blue is cosmic variance limit, gray is what CMBS4 can achieve. And you see that you can really constrain the, the sum of neutrino masses through the through their effects on the on the lensing potential, and uh, this is uh, this is taken from the uh, CMBS4 science book. And the constraints that can be achieved with Planck currently, there's an upper limit that uh, uh, limits the sum of neutrino masses to less than 0.12 at 95% confidence level. Simon's Observatory will significantly improve that constraint to about 31 milli electron volts and CMB is for to around 20 milli electron volts. And this measurement is one of the, uh, the places where the measurement of the optical depth is really important because you're trying to inf uh, compare how much power there is on, on different scales in the, in the spectrum. And so you need, to, you need to know what the optical depth is. Let me say a few words still about the, the Hubble tension. Um, uh, just here is one plot that's highlighting what it is. I think everyone is probably familiar with the Hubble tension because you also had talks about it. So here are the measurements from, uh, from the CMB and one sees that they are systematically below measurements from uh, by Reese et al. There are uh, also other local measurements by uh, Wendy Friedman and collaborators, by uh, Holy Cow, the strong lensing results. And so um, I guess one can debate exactly what the local uh, value of, of H0 is. And I think really that's the part that has to be pinned down. But it, it's, it seems true that the CMB systematically predicts a, a lower value for H0. And I, I want to just make a few comments, which is that the CMB really has a very limited sensitive uh, sensitivity to the present expansion rate. It doesn't really know about that intrinsically. What is really done is that we measure the frequency spectrum of the CMB that gives us an exquisite measurement of the energy density or the temperature of the photons that we, we know very well. Sometimes people ignore that there was another measurement and uh, say, oh, what happens if we drop FIRAS? But really this has been measured quite well. Uh, then, uh, 
in the CMB anisotropies, once you know this, really provide tight constraints on the acoustic angular scale at last scattering, which is the, the sound horizon divided by the angular diameter distance. Uh, then the primordial power spectrum, the baryon density, dark matter density, and the optical depth, but not really the, the present expansion rate. So what is usually done if you're quoting other parameters from the CMB is that they're referred to as derived parameters, meaning that you assume some underlying model, for example, lambda CDM, and then you know what the angular scale is as a function of your parameters. And you can then solve that for little h, and that gives you this value of, of 67.36, but it's not really a direct measurement. So there isn't obviously a contradiction right away between uh, two measurements. There is a contradiction between a, a measurement in a value that's inferred based on, on a model. So you might say uh, you can just change the, the model before we talk about that here, the forecasts. And you see that the uncertainties that are possible on uh, H naught, sigma H naught in this sense are really quite small and so small that it's not even necessarily meaningful. So you can just think of the, the current constraints. I mean, this is kind of what we have. And then the question is, which which is it? I mean, is it the, the low numbers? Is it the, the higher local numbers? So what is it? Uh, you might say that because the CMB really only cares about the early universe, maybe you can just change the, the low redshift universe, but there's additional data, including supernova data, large scale structure data. And so late time modifications actually uh, seem challenging as a solution. And so people then say, oh, but we don't really know much about the early universe, so we can just change the early universe physics, because as I said, the angular scale is the sound horizon uh, divided by the angular diameter distance. The other option is to change the sound horizon, but the sound horizon is a sound horizon. It tells you how much, uh, how, how far the, the sound uh, traveled in a certain amount of time or by the time of, of last scattering. And so it doesn't help you if you don't know the universe when it was a fraction of a second old because that has a negligible contribution to the sound horizon. So the only way to really make a dent and, and have an effect is to change this around the time of last scattering. So you would have to change it by order one at a redshift of 10 to the four or by 10% at 10 to the three. And this is really tightly constrained and will be tightly constrained by the CMB because it exactly probes the, the modes that enter the horizon at those redshifts. Uh, I, I, to, to show that visually, I want to, uh, I'll just show you here the plot I showed you in the beginning, the various angular power spectra. And then I show you uh, at what redshift the different modes enter schematically. So you have modes around L of 100 enter at a redshift uh, at a, of around 3000. And then as you go to smaller scales here, around uh, L of a thousand, you, you're probing scales of, uh, uh, of modes that enter the horizon at a redshift of around three times 10 to the four. You can go up in the data to probe redshifts essentially between uh, the present and about 10 to the five and uh, really most sensitive between uh, uh, last scattering, let's say a redshift of 10 to the three and 10 to the, 10 to the five. And that's exactly where you would have to make a modification. So if there is such a modification, the measurements of the small scale polarization data will really give us a very good idea. And so the, the CMB measurements will contribute to the Hubble tension, not necessarily by measuring Hubble better because they're not really directly measuring Hubble particularly well, but they're measuring uh, the, and they're already measuring uh, Hubble in a model dependent way at high uh, sensitivity now, but they will contribute significantly by making improved measurements of the damping tail, which is where any any new physics would really have to show up that's, uh, that's usually proposed. And so with this, let me just conclude and say that the CMB has provided us with invaluable information about the early universe for 56 years or so since the discovery by Penzias and Wilson. And it will do that for another decade and a half or so. Um, maybe longer, depends on, on how it goes, uh, what we see uh, in, in that period. The degree scale polarization, as I mentioned, is uniquely sensitive to gravitational waves that are present at recombination, which makes it exciting to, to look for. And either, I think either a detection or an upper limit are really interesting. And the small scale polarization contains information about light relics, neutrino mass, structure formation, anything 
many many ideas that you might have of uh, physics beyond the standard model and to achieve uh, the science goals really is challenging but all seems uh, seems possible and so it looks like the next decade and a half should be quite exciting for the for the CMB and hopefully then also for uh, for particle physics or the lessons that we learned for particle physics from the CMB and with that let me just say thanks again to the organizers and then see if there's any any questions thank you Rafael stock and um, so the word is now uh, to the audience uh, Valerio already has a question please Valerio yes uh, you did mention spectral distortions uh, oh yeah I, I should have uh, so spectral distortions uh, yeah so we unfortunately the experiments that I've shown here are not particularly good at, at constraining those. So the best measurements are the ones that I mentioned by, uh, by FIRAS. This was in, the, uh, in 1990. So I think it's, it's time to, to redo these measurements. And there are some, some efforts. They're also very interesting because they constrain uh, interesting, uh, interesting physics, energy, uh, anything that injects energy into the system. I, I didn't talk about them because this particular set of experiments won't really teach us anything new about them. But hopefully we'll see another experiment that uh, that does that. And Jens Schluber has been uh, working hard on on that uh, and others. And so hopefully we'll see that soon. Uh, David de Bronhurst. Um, yes, um, when you're talking about such small uncertainties in the spectral index and anticipating even smaller ones. Does it still make sense to parameterize that spectrum by a perfect power law, by a single parameter? So I think that's a good question. In the context of uh, slow roll inflation, uh, as you know, the uh, running is usually down one more power in, in terms of uh, slow roll parameters. So it depends on, on what you have in mind. And I guess we'll see that in the data. I mean, if that turns out to no longer be a good fit, then of course you would add additional parameters. From a theory perspective, we have a concrete prediction of what we think the running should be in small, uh, small, uh, in in inflation models, in the simple inflation models, and we're not uh, unfortunately able to detect the the running that you would expect in the uh, in the simplest inflation models. So in that sense, in that context, it still makes sense, and I think that's the first thing people will try. If it then turns out that it provides a bad fit, then obviously you try to understand what's going on. But for now, also because the naive theory expectation for the simplest models of inflation is that the running is quite small, this I think will be the default parameterization. But of course, people will constrain the running and see if there's any uh, larger running than you would have expected. But unfortunately, there's a clear target of what you expect. Unfortunately, we can't reach that with these experiments. Thank you. Okay. Oh yes, can I? Yes, yes, yes. good. So, because, uh, well, very nice talk, uh, Rafael. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, I think when you mentioned light bird, I didn't get uh, what values of R they will they are going to explore. Could, could you remind me about that? It's essentially the same as CMBS for 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 the level of discussion we're having here. So the the sigma r that's being targeted is uh, in that case let's call it five point seven times ten to the minus four, and then one has to be a bit careful exactly what is quoted. So that's the statistical. Then there's uh, systematic uncertainties. Then there's often some margin that's quoted, but they are quite sense uh, quite similar CMBS four and Lightbird in terms of raw sensitivity to r. Of course. That's not the only thing one should think about, because if you think about uh, CMBS4, as I showed you, it's really targeting the recombination uh, peak. So it has no information about what's going on on, uh, in, on the reionization bump, whereas Lightbird would be able to also see the reionization bump. So they see different parts of the, the spectrum at different levels of sensitivity. So they are complementary in, in some sense. The, the raw sensitivity for sigma R is essentially the same uh, for, for both of them around five times 10 to the minus four is a good number to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. And, and one uh, other point is that 
there were some papers last year about the curvature that people said that there may be some <clears throat> disagreement. So is, can you comment on that and, and what can be said in the future? Yeah, I think this, uh, this was in, in the connection. I think the, the papers you're mentioning are in connection to the Hubble tension where there was a claim that maybe if you have curvature, you can explain some of these, uh, some of these, uh, some of these things. Uh, this will all be more tightly constrained uh, with these experiments. I mean, even, even at the time, I, I didn't find it a particularly compelling explanation because this is something that you can maybe do with the CMB, but it's much harder, much, uh, harder to then uh, reconcile with other data sets like barren acoustic oscillation. So I'm already not sure that that's a compelling, uh, compelling explanation, but I think it's good to explore all these things and keep an open mind and, and see what what could be breaking down in our model, assuming that there is anything breaking down. But I think it's good to keep an open mind. Okay, thank and, you. And thank this, you. Will, this will be much more constrained. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I actually have um, two questions. So first of all, you showed the Phyrus and Cobra. I actually didn't know what Cobra is, and it seems that the difference uh, is larger than the error bus from your slide. Uh, the measurement of T0. I think they're consistent. Let me go back. Uh, so if you take 2.51 plus minus 6, so this is consistent. La oh, right? oh it's uh, on the last. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so I they're consistent was... with each other, which is good okay. news. <laughs> okay. And then this but was a, a sounding rocket by a, a three man team in, in Canada, uh, Herb Gash. Uh, and uh, uh, Halpern and Wishnow, I think. And then, uh, and so, yeah, uh, so this I mean, was a sounding rocket there. And it, it was just after Firas. So it could have been that they scooped, uh, scooped Firas, but that didn't, uh, didn't turn out quite to be the case. But if you look at the, for the publication, it's just after, after that. And there were uh, previous un unsuccessful attempts, but the, that group has been uh, trying, was trying to measure this. Understand about the the, the monomials uh, and uh, you know the, the monodromy. I mean, uh, yeah. the NS prediction is uh, is also very much dependent on uh, where uh, you put uh, the NE faults, right? So, for instance, uh, if you have interrupted inflation, you could. Uh, I am not saying that you couldn't add okay. epicycles to make them still work. I, I think that's true. So here I'm showing the, the range between uh, 57 and 47. So it, okay. it's true that you can shift it over by that. You, you can also shift it by having additional degrees of freedom and, and it, it, there are ways to, to moving them. So what I'm showing here is just the, the simplest single field monomial prediction. You, you, can, you can change that mm -hmm. and, and try to make it work. Also, yeah, again about that, and then uh, I shut up. Uh, in uh, most models uh, uh, that uh, claim to solve the H0 tension, an S uh, is quite high. Uh, so... I guess you could try to play games like this. I'm not saying that you couldn't try to use this. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that. Uh... So what do you think? You're saying that uh, when uh, CMB will uh, constrain the, uh, the the dumping tail very precisely, it will uh, also uh, shed light on you know uh, these other parameters. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think that's clear that uh, that that will happen. I, I'm not. I don't know how it's gonna go. I mean, the default assumption, if depending on who you are, might be that you just see the boring the boring version of course it could be that we see something exciting in that data i mean there is a lot of information as i said still left uh, to be extracted and maybe that's where all the new physics is hiding and, and we'll see it soon i mean that would obviously be exciting um that's it's definitely possible um i'm just i guess maybe not that optimistic about <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm more worried that that's not how it's gonna turn out i mean I'm, we could have also already seen gravitational waves. I mean, the experiments are now certainly sensitive enough to have seen the, this kind of signal and we really haven't seen it. Doesn't mean we're not gonna see it. I mean, we're, we're working hard on, on, on trying to make a detection, but so yeah, the, the physics could all be hiding here. That's, that's true. But if, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know, being uh, optimistic, uh, 
the, the mean of bicep now is away from zero. So maybe that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Although there you should also then look exactly what the fluctuations are in the foregrounds and where the, the pin fluctuates and so on. I mean, you know, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know when to interpret that. I don't know why it's so slow with my slides now. Sorry. I don't know. I, I, I then find it somewhat worrying that the upward fluctuation is exactly where you have an upward fluctuation in the foreground. It's a bit unfortunate. I mean, it makes you wonder a little bit. But of course, yeah, I mean, uh, there's indeed, th that's also why you have an upper limit that's less than uh, 3.5 times 10 to the minus 2 and a, a sigma r that's less than 10 to the minus 1. So indeed, the central value is slightly above zero, but often that's what happens, right? I mean, you tighten it and then the central value moves down. That's kind of what has been happening. Hopefully, I mean, I, I am hopeful that we see something. I, I've been spending a lot of time on uh, the different experiments on Lightbird, on CMBS4. I mean, I'm not doing it to place upper limits, ideally. I, I, it would be nice to see something, right? That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? was clear so if there are none then uh, uh, I think we can uh, uh, we can uh, uh, thank uh, Rafael and uh, we'll uh, reconvene uh, uh, next time with the GGI T-Breaks. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thanks. Thanks.